articles. The first one is Chipotle stock um, approved a 50 to one stock split. I saw that. <laughs> 50 to one stock split. I don't think so, I've ever heard of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the first place, why Chipotle is $2,900 a share is beyond me. Um, it was, it used to be owned by McDonald's. They don't have any stake in it anymore, yes. but I mean, they, this just goes to show you that they're, they are just trying to, to juice the price. Cause usually when you split it like that and you're, you're letting more investors be able to get into it. So they have plans or, you know, my underlying thought behind that is that they have future issues that they're trying to raise some capital on. Welcome to the Half Truth uh, for this week. Uh, joined here with Patrick Moorhead. As always, we're here to give you a little bit of truth, a little bit mixed with the other half of the truth that may not be there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, I know Patrick's got a couple of articles. I've got one. Um, it's been a uh, still some pretty interesting week from last week uh, since we've seen the ones on here again. Um, so go ahead, Patrick. I'll let you get started. Yeah, this this week's kind of been dominated with the interest rate talk, you know, with the Fed and all that type of thing. So if it's not AI, it's interest rates that seem to be dominating dominating the market. Um, the first quick one that I just wanted to reference to last week is. Uh, Paramount, the TV company, movie theater company, um, their stock price surged because Apollo offered to buy them the studio for $11 billion. So last week we were talking about private equity coming in and buying fuck all. Well, now they're, they want to buy movie studios and then control what we see and what happens in that regard. Hmm. Um, but my two main articles, the first one is Chipotle stock, um, approved a 50 to one stock split. I saw that <laughs> 50 to one stock split. I don't think so, I've ever heard of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the first place, why Chipotle is $2,900 a share is beyond me. Um, it was, it used to be owned by McDonald's. They don't have any stake in it anymore, yes. but I mean, they, this just goes to show you that they're, they are just trying to, to juice the price. Cause usually when you split it like that and you're, you're letting more investors be able to get into it. So they have plans or, you know, my underlying thought behind that is that they have future issues that they're trying to raise some capital on. Um, you know, because they can increase the price even more, sell their shares and go and inject money in, into the, the market because AI that they're talking about is coming around the corner. They, you know, McDonald's can do vending machines, you know, or the, the little kiosk things to order stuff. Chipotle can't really do that. So they got to infuse much more money into their process to eliminate this cost of labor, labor that's coming down the pipe. So whether that's true rumor, you know, my brain going off on a on a tangent, I don't know, but that's kind of my underlying thinking behind them doing a 50 to one stock split. Like like you said, I've never heard that or seen that big of a split. Yeah, I think the biggest I've ever seen was like a 10 for one. I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever seen anything outside of that. Everything's and that's even three. rare. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I've always, you know, you bring up an interesting point just about the, you know, the price of the stock, I, you know, why it's, uh, you know, as high as it was or is slash was based on what time you were looking at it, if they did a 50 for one split <laughs> or now. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I love, I like Chipotle. It's a great place, but um, it's, uh, I mean, it's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how many, like, it was how many years ago that they had all those problems of salmonella or, you know, disease, whatever, you know, type of thing. And the stock was taking a huge hit and then it turns around and, you know, everybody forgets about that and runs it up to almost three grand a share. I don't know. Yeah. Crazy, crazy freaking world we live in. Yeah. No kidding. Um, well, I'll jump into mine and uh, then we can wrap it up with yours. Um, so mine is, 
and Patrick, before we jumped on to our listeners, the three or four of you, <laughs> as of our last video, we need more, um, uh, pointed out once I read him the title of it, um, where it was, uh, who actually wrote the article, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, so it's, uh, the title of it is, is I'm retired. How much should I keep in stocks, bonds, and cash? And Patrick, why don't you go ahead and tell them what your guess was on who wrote that article? <laughs> well, smart asset, because it's yeah. there, there's a lot of them. It's either smart asset or Motley Fool that do those types of of articles nowadays. Yeah. So. Well, just a quick breakdown. It uh, it's usually it's the usual ambiguous information. Um, you know, it opens up with uh, well, it all depends on your risk tolerance. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> everything does whether you're 70 whether you're 40 whether you're 30 it's all about your risk and where you are um in life um what will say the the you know the truthful part about it that i did like is it talked about breaking your assets into buckets um and having you know a cash bucket um an income bucket and a growth bucket which i thought was great However, still very ambiguous, um, you know, because you can you can totally pick that apart no matter what your risk tolerance is, um, because, you know, they don't take into account for other assets that you may have invested in, whether it's, you know, let's say you have rental properties or something like that or other things that you invest in outside of the typical, you know, stocks, bonds, cash, that kind of stuff. Um, but more importantly, I think one of the big areas that it left out is, you know, within these, you know, or not so much the buckets is, you know, where, where the market cycles are, you know, and we've seen this actually over the last 10 years, very good example is, you know, uh, over the last 10 years, tech has been a big place to be having your money invested. Um, but is tech going to be the next 10 years? Um, I know Patrick and I have touched on this a little bit um, in previous videos, but, you know, I think one of the big things and problems with it was is there's a lack of like market cycles. And, you know, even like you look at mutual funds, which both Patrick and I are not hot on you know, they will rotate. They have rotational periods where they will rotate from various sectors based on the cycles of the market. So just to automatically assume that, you know, whether it's 60-40 or a 60-30-10, um, and then you throw them in whichever category you want, cash, bonds, or stocks, whatever the weight is, within that, the problem is, is there's, you could be, in a sector or in a market, in a cycle that's in a sector that is going to have, going to be very depreciated or very uh, underwhelmed, or uh, what am I saying, is is, is not going to perform very well for your portfolio based on the cycle, even though you have followed the, you know, this person's potential advice. And I think that's a big misconception. I mean, you know, so if you, you know, one could argue that if you've been involved in, you know, energy outside of right now, um, you know, or, or certain areas, you know, your growth as compared to somebody or your earnings compared to somebody who was invested in tech, at least for, you know, the last 10 years or, you know, some time of that, uh, you know, your, your, your portfolio is going to, that person's portfolio is going to look way different than the person that was just like, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and choose XYZ ETF or, or mutual fund. That's pretty broad based. You're not going to, so it's, it's, it's very, again, very ambiguous. I, there's a lot more detail that I think needs to be expressed in these things when it comes to market cycles, optimization, rotating, you know, I mean, you know, Patrick and I've talked about this too, because you know, you know, I think there's, you know, really five core asset classes you have, you know, obviously the equity markets, which everybody talks about, you have, you know, the bond markets, interest rates, which is Patrick just touched on, you have real estate and you have commodities and then energy. Well, it's also part of that sector at the end, but, you know, those are, those are five major sectors that, you know, people are rotating money around all the time. So you could be, you could feel like that you have the perfect, you know, bucket situation or percentage situation 
but you could be in the wrong sector because it's in the wrong cycle of things. So again, uh, you know, talk to a friend, you know, do some research when it comes to these things, because just choosing a 60, 40 or 60, 30, 10 or 50, 50 or whatever your percentage may be. And based on your risk level still is not the best course for most people. And I think mo like that 60, 40 or that the split like that is, is going away. Like advisors, you know, uh, people who give advice are steering away from that. That's just old data, old information, the old way of doing things. Cause now everything's traded by algos, you know, algorithms. So yeah. that has a huge effect. I mean, we saw it in 2022 where bonds and stocks went down. So it's, and it's not just having stocks and bonds in your portfolio. Like you said, there's, there's more investment classes out there, but people are waking up to the fact that you can't just shift your, your portfolio as you get older. And that's why everybody now is talking crap about uh, target date funds, because that's all target date funds do. And the other disadvantage of that, or when somebody writes an article with bonds and stocks, is that they're not talking about bonds. They're talking about mutual fund or ETF bonds to where they're constantly sold inside there, and they are just as volatile as the stock market. There's no rhyme or reason to be in those type of things. If you're going to have a bond portfolio, have actual bonds. And that 60-40 yes. split when, that they were doing back in the day, they didn't actually have bonds, or it was a small percentage if they did in there. So that's where you're gonna get hit even harder is if you don't have the physical bonds, because even if the price of a bond you know, stops or drops down, as long as you hang on to it, you're gonna get your money back as long as the company doesn't go bankrupt or something you know, outside of the norm. But if the price just fluctuates because of interest rates, just hang on to the bond. Whereas mutual funds and ETFs, they sell and buy those things on a regular basis. So they'll sell them at a loss, sell them at a gain, and you have no control over that. Right. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, buying the physical, we found, you know, I, the, the time that I've been in this, in this career, you know, I've, the, all the glory goes to the stock market. You know, you and I've talked about that Patrick before, um, but really well, but the bond the, market is what three times the size, four times the size larger. of the equity yeah. market. Yeah. It's huge. I mean, most, you know, that's, that's really what, you know, that's the that's the Titanic, <laughs> not the little skiff that's hanging off the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that that was my article for the day. I'm trying to you know just stick with more of these you know uh, these people that are trying to offer up some sort of advice that's you know just so ambiguous it doesn't leave you with anything at the end. <laughs> Um, the last one going back that I have is, you know, the Fed just recently announced this week that they're keeping interest rates the same, or as this article says, the Fed is keeping interest rates high for now, which we talked about in a lot other video that historically were not high. Um, but then it says, mm -hmm. what does this mean for your credit cards? And to me, I wanted to first touch on the fact that this is what people kind of get confused with the most. You know, the, the Fed rate is not adjusting bonds. It's not adjusting mortgages. It's not adjusting credit card, you know, debt or anything like that, which this article kind of talks about that, that it, it has really no direct impact on your credit card interest rates. Um, and that's what I think people forget about. You know, this doesn't, it's a trickle down effect that it has on all of those things across the board. But my biggest takeaway that they don't really mention or, you know, what I kind of got from this of reading the headline in the article is why are they talking about interest rates on credit cards? You know, the proper way to have a credit card is to pay it off every single month. But if I can share a graph, um, you can see that interest rates have been skyrocketing. Um, and it doesn't share. I don't know why I can't share it. But um, credit card debt. Auto loans, um, consumer loans are now going through the roof for delinquencies. So the, the amount of credit card debt that people are having. So, I mean, what you see in the stock market and what's announced on the news is not what's happening in the real economy to the general person. You know, a lot of people are feeling the pinch and putting a lot of things on their credit card, withdrawing from the 401ks and all that type of stuff. So to me, getting an article like this during this time shows that, okay, they know people have a lot of debt. So they're, you know, want to 
get a tagline to get people to click on it, to read about it because they know everybody's carrying a balance on their credit card right now. Um, and yeah, it has no direct impact. Your interest rates on your credit card is not going to change. They're still going to charge you the 28 billion percent that you're getting charged on that, which is just stupid money. Um, but I, I just think it's funny in this time of the, the cycle, and we're probably going to look back on this later and, you know, laugh that, you know, we were spot on maybe, I don't know, but it, this is going to be a point where we're going to remember in, in history, I feel like. Yeah, I, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, interest rates and, you know, people's lack of knowledge of what the, the Fed funds rate is and how it how it affects the overall market. It has no no bearing whatsoever when it comes to your interest rates on your credit cards um, or anything else for that matter, you know, any of those types of, like he said, car loans, auto loans, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and we're, we're, we haven't hit what we were at in 2009, 2010 when it peaked, but we're we're going quick. Like it's it keeps going up pretty quick. So by the end of this year, it's going to be interesting where those numbers are. Yeah, I mean, I've seen. It's funny you bring that up because I've seen some art, actually some articles, and maybe I should uh, read a few of those so I could chime in on this conversation with you. <laughs> and find something different. But yeah, I've seen a few articles, uh, you know, with that clickbait kind of headline of, you know, uh, Americans have, you know, or it, the, their credit card debt is increasing at, you know, X percentage, you know, year over year or something like that. You know, are you, uh, are can you handle it or something? You know? Yeah. <laughs> will you, will you make it through or will you be able to survive and that kind of stuff? But yeah, and also with the 401ks, I've seen articles talking about just the vast amount of people that are taking out loans from their 401k to either, you know, pay for credit card debt or pay for other things, which is not a good yeah. scenario to be in because you're essentially resetting part of your clock. Uh, when it comes to retirement. Well, one on thing that I don't, um, I don't have the article on it, but the BOJ, the Bank of Japan, just announced they're coming out of negative rates for the first time in, what, 17 years or something like that? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. that's going to have, a you know, an impact on a lot of things. So, we'll see what uh -huh. plays out from that. Well, and uh, I know you you and I've talked about it recently is, you know, speaking of interest rates is, you know, if anybody goes back and looks, anybody that watches this video, you can go look this up online at the, you know, fred.com or whatever, the federal, the, the, that website. Um, but, you know, from 1940. <laughs> that website. Oh, yeah, it's what Fred at the New York, or not New York, but um, the, uh, it's just F-R-E-D, yeah. Treasury, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the, off the top of my head, but anyways, so, you know, from 1940 to 1980, you had, you know, rising interest rates, and then from 1980 to basically 2020, just four years ago, you've had declining interest rates. The interesting part is, is where we are, and it seems like, we don't know for sure, but it seems like we could be in a situation where we're now in a new cycle, like I mentioned, where we could be on a more upward trend of interest rates versus like everybody's expecting to happen, you know, to go back down to two or three or four percent. And I'm just I'm not totally convinced about some of that just yet. So, you know, we talk to our parents, you know, most of our parents when they purchase their house. You know, they were purchasing their, you know, their first house at, you know, 12 percent, you know, the interest rate on their house was you know, 12 percent you know, or more cases, depending on how old your parents are. Right. <laughs> you <Yep. laughs> know, so, anyways, I'll leave it with that. All right. I think we'll leave the whole video with that. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you again next week. <laughs> yeah.